right, we will move on to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Marco Corta from uh, from Rubido, and they were actually the first company to uh, sponsor uh, sponsor us here. So without you, this would have never happened. You know. I know. So right? please join <laughs> us. Thank you, Martin. That's a magic button right here. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you, organizers, for the opportunity to present to do another amazing RDD. And uh, I'm really excited to share some of the work that we're doing at Rubedo Life Sciences today. Uh, disclaimer, I'm a co-founder and shareholders in the company. So Rubedo discovers and develops medicine to extend a healthy lifespan and by targeting the pathological cells that emerge with age and drive disease. And we do that by um, a computational strategy to really identify, discover those cells in the target associated with that and then translating this into a chemistry uh, to engineer small molecules that can selectively target those cells. And currently we're focusing in areas of chronic inflammation and degenerative fibrosis. And these are really entry points into larger therapeutic areas for you know, uh, truly longevity therapeutics. And the company is built around a very interdisciplinary group of uh, cross-functional team from um, drug hunters, from pharma who brought into the clinic, into the market drugs, uh, experts in aging longevity, and um, Silicon Valley software engineers, data scientists, experts. So but today I'm going to really focus about um, a question that is around the heterogeneity of cellular senescence, and, and specifically, is there one senescent cell state, or there are many, and why this is important? It's important if you think this in terms of uh, drug discovery and development. And I'll, I'll touch base on how we try to solve this answer to these questions using an AI-driven single cell multiomic strategies to enable a drug discovery for that. And I'll, uh, I'll end with an example of a therapeutic uh, approach that uh, we are developing. So you know, we're very familiar with why aging is the ultimate risk factor. But uh, the reason we're here because we think this is a plastic uh, phenomenon. So we can change the onset of development of um, age-related diseases, moving back on time or even reversing it. But that means um, can also happen on the other direction, right? So the, the biological age is kind of actually is uncoupled from the chronological age. And this happens. There is premature aging that can happen following... Um, genetic uh, conditions, environmental, like COVID, SARS-CoV-2 is a driver of cellular senescence and actually premature aging the survivors. And so when this happens, when the biological aging is kicking in, and then when we see the emergence of multiple uh, factors that integrate, but uh, emerging cells that are really uh, become pathological. And extreme examples well known as cancer cells, but senescent cells or senescent-like cells is another. And there are many others that are really still undiscovered. So uh, today I'm going to focus about the senescent or senescent-like cells, which is uh, a great therapeutic opportunity. For, for this space, um, among others. And probably many here are familiar with what senescent cells are, but um, it's important to say, so any cells can become senescent potentially, upon injury, upon damage, and uh, they have commonalities that they stop dividing, typically um, they're very resistant to, to cell death, and they're metabolically very active, releasing a cocktail of cytokines, metalloproteases, defined as SAS which are very important because they call the immune system on site. And in a healthy, useful environment, actually, they help and enable the clearance and regenerative, uh, rejuvenative, uh, regenerative response, in the sense. Um, but so this positive function can promote wound dealing, regeneration, is a tumor suppressor mechanism, so they're good. But it's a pleiotropic function which means it can also play an opposite effect. And indeed, with aging, damage, uh, disease, uh, this uh, in reality changes. Uh, those senescent cells can escape immune cells, um, immune cells aging too, and then they, they start to cooperate by driving a chronic inflammatory state that can degenerate in tissue, uh, degeneration, fibrosis, and promote cancer. 
So it's clear how they're now behind many age-related diseases. Now, preclinically, now we start to see this in the clinic as well. So in this sense, it's a master regulator of aging. Now, there are many ways that uh, we can induce, and that happens, and uh, the senescence can be induced. And we at Rubedo are really working to elucidate and understand all the different modalities and what that means. But that doesn't mean that they all become the same. The same cells exposed to different triggers might actually become different uh, type of senescent cells, which is important because they might actually be targeted differently in different indications, in different clinical uh, indications and pathology. So today I'm just focusing about the uh, cytotoxic uh, drug that can induce uh, cellular senescence, which is actually the base for chemotherapy, cancer of, uh, of um, the standard of care in cancer, which is a form of prematurely aging. Cancer survivors are prematurely aged, here we can see that uh, patients that receive chain point inhibitors permanently um, reduce their baseline. They never recover really a healthy, um, healthy score. And, uh, and this is true for the elderly, actually is aggravated and elderly, they're already aged. But that is not necessarily uh, only for the elderly. Even pediatric cancer that receive uh, radiotherapy, chemotherapies, they actually prematurely age permanently in many cases. Um, if you look here, uh, looking at one marker associated with cellular senescence, which is P16, which is not necessarily the best, in some cases not even a good marker of senescence, but generally associated with that. We see that before and after those patients actually increase those markers, which are associated with um, uh, assessment associated with aging, increasing a frailty score as well as sarcopenia which was not, was not even accepted in the clinic, sadly, and now it started to become understood. So we look carefully about those, and I'm just showing an example here of a, a lung fibroblast cell line, AMR90s, that we induced in senescence using two standard of care treatments, doxorubicin, so a combo therapy of doxorubicin plus fly fluorouracil, which is are using breast cancer in, in other um, uh, treatments. Now, they look like the same. They express the same markers, at least in vitro. But they actually, when we used an, an, an established senolytic BCH2 class inhibitor, Navitoclax, that can uh, work or very differently based on the induction of senescence on the same cell type, losing potassium selectivity. And you know, when you profile those cells transcriptomically, we see there is a divergence of genes, and sometimes there is not even overlap. So we see these really um, uh, clearly differences on the same cell types, but assuming different state of cellular senescence. And just that's an example of uh, a pathways, but as we look at pathways regulation, we see a completely different landscape. With some pathways, like in this case is an extracellular matrix um, organization, pathways goes in the opposite directions, depending on the method of inductions. And the modality is the same, they still in chemotherapy induced senescence, but they actually are different, they behave differently. Now, if we move from a cancer cell uh, or an immortalized cells, which is actually a good model of cancer, really, to primary cells. So we uh, now looking at IPF patients, lung-derived primary uh, senescent fibroblast. We see that Vitoplax actually is losing selectivity and potency. So it might not actually be good for that specific indication. And this is true not just for humans, but as we look in rodents, mice, rats, or hamsters, what we see in typically works well as a senolytic in cell lines actually uh, is not really the case for primary cells. And this is just an example, really, as we look across different cell lines, I'm showing here, and we, we, we spent years in developing models and profiling them, I'm showing here 10 different cell lines and seven different method of inductions. And we use our platform to generate the signatures and look in this matrix, there is a, a high heterogeneity of those. And when we compare a single cell RNA sequencing from uh, different, different cell types obtained from IPF patients with different models, we see some are very different and some actually resemble them better. So again, suggesting it's really important to, uh, to identify the right models to look for the right targets and therapeutic development. And that's really, to enable this, we build uh, Alembic, which is our platform that really helps to, um, one of the things it does is helping elucidating with different uh, math uh, systems uh, that we developed in-house, this heterogeneity at single cell level. 
and so Olympic, Olympic is really based on uh, um, leveraging single cell RNA sequencing and other uh, uh, like omics data, spatial transcriptomics, proteomics, etc. To, uh, to have that level of single cell resolution, because we're talking about rare cells with high heterogeneous. So it's important to understand, even within the, the, the senescent cell type, which one is the one that you may want to target in a specific uh, disease or condition of patient population. And so the platform is really, uh, well, is at this point very sophisticated as in different modules. And uh, I want to do a shout out to our CTO, Alex Lazlavik, who really built it from the ground up. And uh, Alex uh, came from a very, as an outlier in the field in the sense he had a leading role as a uh, software engineer from tech companies like Facebook and others, and really came and built with his team here um, a fully developed platform with a user interface, cloud base, use cross-functional in the company, biologists and chemists to log in and they can really work through this. It's actually a very useful tool that um, enable from uh, identification of cell targets and target identification, uh, the chemistry development for that enable the, the medchem process, but importantly also the development of preclinical models in vitro and in vivo that are really uh, aligned to the cell type that we discovered initially. So that really helps in driving the discovery process down the pipeline. And you know, this is an example of, uh, as we look at single cell data from RNA sequencing of uh, IPF patients, uh, lung tissue. Um, so in this case, using a sem semi-supervised deep learning model to really identify this and, class and classify those cells and generating an array of signatures um, that are then scored, analyzed, and annotated in a way that help us to funneling down and identify what cells do we want to look in clinical samples and then develop models and, and looking to targets. So downstream to that, uh, we can uh, look at you know, pathways and target uh, regulation and potential uh, identifying that leads to uh, hits to compounds that will go down into the development. But associated with the, your cell target also come, this is really a screenshot from, from the, one of the aspects of the platform, uh, we can uh, identify some metabolic signatures that are associated with your cell target. Why is so important? Because then we combine those in our engineering of these small molecules that are then designed to selectively target your, your cell type. And so switching gear, I mean, I give an example of um, one of the early days, I mean, what this is on a tool compound. That's how we started initially. That's how we actually we started the company thinking to develop an initial um, like prototype right, as a prodrug that is, uh, can selectively target, uh, in this case, um, using non-metabolic activities and just a generic uh, uh, um, agent uh, to see if we can turn into a selective compound that can target certain type of senescent cells. So the work at least part of the work is published in a preprint and uh, um, the peer-reviewed work is, uh, is going to be hopefully out soon. But I'm presenting some unpublished work as part of the peer review process today as well. So in these early days, um, now the idea, and that's one of the modalities that we can employ, and we employed, uh, among others that we now have into the pipeline, uh, was to take a, a compound as a parent drug uh, using as a warhead that has some xenotoxicity, or at least it can kill senescent cells. And then identifying uh, metabolites that can be engineered and become promoieties uh, that can inactivate this war warhead. So the resulting prodrug, that we composed by multiple promoieties, um, is used to uh, be converted intracellularly in your target cells. So then you can only uh, target the cells when it's in the right uh, state, in this case, senescent uh, cell state. So in these in this studies, in this proof of concept, uh, we employed, so we, we, we screened a few compounds to identify the, among chemotherapy agents. We identified fluorouracil actually that can um, uh, kill senescent cells, but also proliferating. It's not a good senolytic. We use this because uh, we identified by being able to interfere with the RNA sequencing to also be killing senescent cells. But they generated a galactose derivative prodrug to take advantage of a known marker of senescent cells. Again, not a perfect or great marker, but associated with at least some of them, beta-galactosides, which is an hydrolase expressing the lysosomal compartment of those cells, to convert this prodrug back into an active drug. 
and not have the time today here to present um, all the in vitro characterization, but uh, so where we, we see that this actually happens in vitro in senescent cell different models, but I really want to focus on some of the in vivo work. So when we treat and we dose young mice with uh, the parent drug, the fluorouracil, or the prodrug, uh, RBO1000, as we call it here, we see that the parent drug has toxicities, um, hematotoxicities um, and others, loss of body weight, but the prodrug derivative can normalize back to the cell in control, uh, in a way making more tolerated and preventing the side effects. Now this is more true as we look at geriatric mice. So if you dose, and so we use cohorts about 28 months and older, and uh, if you dose uh, a geriatric mouse with a parent drug, it's absolutely not tolerated, so I'm not even showing here, but we were able with the, the prodrug derivative to dose chronically over weeks without seeing any evident side effects. Um, if anything, the spleen, for example, went back to a more like a useful uh, size. And really, a careful hematopoietic characterization of those cells uh, didn't show any significant change. Suggesting again, and this is well tolerated, we did PK studies, we see that the prodrug has a good profile with really minimal conversion systemically. But uh, intracellular is what we want to, to do. So then, uh, to kind of look at the same mechanism of action of conversion of the prodrug by leveraging the hydrolytic uh, activity of beta-galactosidase, we, uh, we employed here a, a prodrug derivative of luciferin to, to treat um, transgenic mice uh, that constitutively express luciferase, so that the the substrate luciferin, but the prodrug is converted then to emit light only in the cells that express a level of this enzyme, beta galactosidase. And we use the model of naturally aged or chemotherapy induced aging uh, using doxorubicin. So those mice show the similar profile that actually matching with other markers uh, associated with cellular senescence, look histologically or by gene expression like P16 or beta gal and others. And, um, and at that, at that time, we're using those markers. We don't rely only on those now. We rely on those signatures generated with Alembic that really can help us keeping track in clinically on the clinical samples um, that are also valuable biomarkers. But those are established markers. And what is interesting, the bioluminescence also correlate with this uh, function. We did a performance score. So the highest the level of bioluminescence, uh, the more the lower the, le the, the score, the activity of these animals. Uh, that is a combination of, um, we are on time? Uh, three, I have here time. Um, so very quickly, we look at frailty. Uh, we use a, a CRIAR system to linear trace mass of stem cells. And um, we see those mice increase activity in, uh, in uh, running wheel computer control cages and overall increase the frailty score. They increase survival. These are not a longevity studies, but they're showing like increase the resilience of those mice during the course of the studies. We look at muscle and we saw improve of, uh, we did electrophysiology, biomechanics. We saw improve of uh, muscle for production in the geriatric mice treated. Um, and challenge these muscles with an injury, cardiotoxin injury, and looking histologically cross-sections and you know, looking at this, uh, tracing the muscle stem cell derived regenerated fibers, we see a shift towards a faster regeneration and also in here also reduced fibrosis. And when we isolate the phyto with cytofluorimetry sorted out uh, the muscle stem cells, we look in vitro that there was improved of activity, self renewal and proliferation, suggesting again that was an improving function that correlates with the physiological function. We look into the brain too. And uh, we did behavioral studies, why maize, Morris water maize, training those mice in, in swimming pool to, work, to learn when the position of the platform is. And we saw geriatric mice can't really learn that over time. And young mice do very well, but uh, geriatric mice treated, they're actually pretty good. They go straight to the platform, it's just very slow, but they, they do it. And they remember well the position of the platform. And that, when we look into the brains, especially in the hippocampus, we did see there is a, a decrease in uh, uh, neuroinflammation. Look at markers such as microglia expansion and activation. And really not changes in neurons, but decrease in senescent cell markers. Also in muscle, didn't show that. And, but increase of uh, neural stem cells, activities and numbers. So uh, that really suggests that this model can be used um, 
to, no, it was our base to think, can we now do this work and uh, on a more sophisticated way? And so I want to thank you know, people that contributed to that. And our scientific collaborators, Professor Tom Brando, who is my mentor at Stanford, where he did my postdoc, and later as an independent in investigator, and Tony Vaiscori. So that really was the base of it. 30 seconds, um, and, uh, and you know, they, the components that we now developed are you know, very potent and very selective, and, um, and that's what really built our pipeline uh, in entry points that we are looking at age-related diseases. You can different modalities, pro-drug and, and non-necessary pro-drugs at this point, uh, leveraging our Alembic platform. And also great shout out to our scientific and clinical advisory board that is supporting us, and thank you for your attention, and reach me for job opportunities, investment, and partnering, and thank you for your attention. Questions, what about questions? Okay, maybe one very quick question, because we have Judith Campisi waiting, and we don't want to keep her waiting. She will be very angry. Quick. Very quick. Uh, thank you very much for your point. Uh, you said that senescence uh, by itself it, uh, it uh, changes the potency of the senolytics. Uh, uh, we can see in the medical practice most of the time after exposure to the chemotherapy or radiotherapy a dramatic acceleration, especially in the phase, rejuvenation of phase of the patient after you know uh, taking all those sessions. So the question is that can we take uh, like uh, uh, flavonoid senolytics like fisetin or carcetin as a prophylactic? before taking those sessions, for example, somebody is taking radiotherapy next uh, week or next uh, chemotherapy, can we take uh, senolytics, drugs? Yeah, thank you for the question. Very quick answer. Uh, first of all, I would not advise anything that has not been tested in the clinic, and this has not. So conceptually, yes, but I think we need to understand which senolytic, how to target, what is the dose therapeutic regime. But potentially, senolytic can help to prevent, yes, but needs to be proven clinically first. All right. Thank you so much, Marco. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.